travelers and welcome to the first of the stars podcast our my loyal listeners thank you for your continued support remember to click that subscribe button everybody an amazing show for you because born in the mothership is dalton k shannon he's the co-writer of frankenstein the unconquered now on kickstarter now come aboard as we go traversing the stars hello mr shannon thank you so much for coming to the first of the stars podcast Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Very totally, exciting. Totally my pleasure, sir. Loving Frankenstein. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no worries. So I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love of comics and who are your earliest influences? Oh, man, we're getting right off the bat into the deep end. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, comics have been uh, a part of my life since I was like eight. Um, I, I, I was always into superheroes. Uh, from the cartoons, but then I saw uh, an issue of Spider-Man on the spinner rack. I'm convinced I was the last person to ever do that in America in the year 2000. Um, but then I discovered what comic books were and uh, completely fell in love with them. I mean, the John Romita Jr. art didn't hurt. Um, and so I just, I, I became obsessed with the the comic books themselves as just like pieces of, of uh, art. Uh, but then I was also reading tangentially to superheroes uh dave pilkey's captain underpants series of novels at the time uh still do those books are great but they're about uh two eight-year-old boys who make their own comic books and oh. i was like oh i could i could do that i could do that that's easy and so i just started drawing and writing and like hand stapling all my own little books together uh and it's been a uh, runaway I don't know if success is the right word, but it's been something uh, ever since. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, you start off slow with the superheroes and you start to gravitate outward. Um, but I mean, Kirby's always been a huge influence. Uh, Grant Morrison, Todd McFarlane, um, basically a lot of cartoonists, um, not as many uh, just straight up like writers or just straight up art. I, I really, I wish I could just, write and draw everything <laughs> <laughs> so i love so, i love collaboration don't get me wrong but there's right, some right. ideas i'm like oh man i just i want to just focus on that but i just can't draw to save my life <laughs> oh same here same here it's, it's been the bane of my existence the inability to draw mm -hmm. if i could draw i'd be producing so much more stuff by now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what you say kind of begs a very important question so we're, we're gonna get serious for a moment and ask it where the hell did you find a comic book on a spinner rack yeah, <laughs> you're right. Very important question. Um, well, I'm from uh, a small town in Arkansas, about uh, 30 minutes out of Little Rock. Uh, and there was a local grocer called Knights. And we would go there some before Walmart came and completely <laughs> screwed them over. Uh, that was where we would go do our grocery shopping after school. And uh, they, there was a spinner wreck. Uh, it was oh, wow. the first time I'd ever seen and, and it was there until nights closed in like 2013 or so. Oh my uh, God. Like they continued to have a spinner rack and I would go it just periodically, even through high school, I'd be like, oh, let's go. Even after I found comic shops, I'm just, there was stuff there that I don't remember ever seeing in comic shops when I finally transitioned. Mm. Like they had a bunch of those, um, what do they call them? Uh, they were like the Marvel Age books, but they were yeah. um, anthologies. So like they had Marvel Age two in one. So you could get Marvel Age Avengers and the Marvel Age Spider-Man all in one book. Or they had Marvel Selects that reprinted uh, Bendis' New Avengers uh, along with, uh, what was the other book? Was It, it might have been Jason Aaron's Ghost Rider at the time. Like they were, oh, wow. uh, you'd have one on one side and then you flip it over and then there's the other book on, on the flip side. That's uh, awesome. And I, I never saw those in comic shops <laughs> at all. And so I, I, I still have those from the spinner rack, but, but once I transitioned over to the comic shop and spinner rack, uh, it, it was the last one to die. I'm convinced. Have you ever seen the documentary? Um, the last blockbuster. I have not, I've seen it floating around, but I've never yeah. actually sat down and watched it. It, it kind of reminds me of like the comic book rack version of the last, like someone should have made a like, documentary about like the last <laughs> spinner rack. <laughs> you know, there has to still be a spinner rack somewhere. There has to be. I, well, you know what? I, we're gonna have to, I'm gonna have to spend my nights now going online trying to look up 
a spinner rack and see if anyone yeah. actually still has one functioning. I mean, heck, uh, I mean, Barnes and Noble still carries um, like the Archie digests. So there's still quite a few grocers who carry those like at their front counters. Uh, I, for a while, Books a Million carried like floppies of like the new 52 stuff up near their magazines. Really? It was, yeah, I don't think they do that anymore. But <laughs> like it was it was wild for just the last holdouts of, of that kind of market. <laughs> Tell me, you, sh- you should have just bought the rack because one day it'll be worth value as the final, the very I, final one. You know, I I should have bought that spinner rack because <laughs> <the> spinner <laughs> racks are actually like legit comic spinner racks are hard to come by. That, that they're badass. You should um, if next time you have a convention, you can put the spinner rack right there, and people yeah. would just probably just come to the table just to spin it. <laughs> I have a I have a mini one that I put on the desk at conventions to hold our ash cans. But, oh really? Uh, but I can't find a full full size one, or at least I'm not looking hard enough. You're, we're gonna that's that's your future mission in life <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> so uh you and wells thompson who unfortunately couldn't join us mm-hmm. are the co-creators of frankenstein the unconquered that um, is true yeah. how did this partnership first happen and what does each bring to the project um oh, how did we okay are so, you the talented one of the two i'm just kidding <laughs> I, I, well at the very least the most good looking you know it's, it's <laughs> no uh we met in college uh, through my wife. Uh, we, uh, I just kind of saw him around. He would have breakfast with us sometimes. And then he was an English major. I was a writing major. And so we then ended up in a lot of classes together. Uh, and uh, we pretty much, we hit it off pretty well. Uh, we both noticed each other had talent that the other didn't necessarily have. Like uh, a lot of my stuff had like uh, goofy surrealistic kind of over-the-top nonsense and his stuff was really like grounded and thematic and a little heavy and I was like okay that's that's weighty but uh, I like it it's good uh we kind of we kind of drifted apart after college um but I was still trying to make comics work like comics have always been the thing there's never been a plan b so I was struggling to make uh, a project work and I couldn't necessarily get it, so I just text Wells. I was like, "Hey, you wanna you wanna look this over? See see if there's anything you could like. What am what am I doing wrong essentially?" Mm. And he took a crack at it. He'd never written comics before, and he was like, "Oh, well, maybe if we did this with a story and this and this." And uh, it it he cracked it, and I was like, "Oh, wow. Okay, hey, you want to do comics?" And he was like, "Why would I ever want to do that?" But then <laughs> <laughs> I tricked him, and uh, now we're now we're. Uh, uh, we're, we're like hip deep in this now we've done uh we did a ton of ash cans together like in-house where uh we both wrote eight pagers and i would draw them we'd hand staple them and take them to conventions uh that led to our anthology descent into dread from caliber comics where a lot of those ash cans got a nice facelift from people who can actually draw uh and then mechaton our other kickstarter book that we run concurrently with frankenstein uh which we're on the second issue of now uh, it's it's been a wild few years, but yeah, past five or six years is we've been kind of chugging along together. Uh, yeah, like Wells brings a lot of uh, the way I like to describe it is I he keeps the wheels on the cart and I make sure the cart's going as fast as possible. <laughs> like he's he's really good at, at characters and uh, theming and uh, kind of that invisible through line that uh, kind of holds that story together. And I'm great at like uh, dialogue and uh, humor and momentum and like big action scenes and things. So uh, together we, uh, we make a pretty good team we balance each other's uh weaknesses out and uh hopefully that shines through in frankenstein <laughs> well the cool thing so i mean frankenstein is, is a uh, i got to read the first issue it's fantastic Thank so you. what inspired the creation of frankenstein the unconquered and what was it about the project that was exciting for you guys i mean frankenstein and meets conan the barbarian what's not exciting right <laughs> <laughs> frankenstein swinging a sword and killing monsters that's just dope uh originally frank was uh I had this idea of like a cosmic Frankenstein where he would kind of travel the cosmos with a sword and a ray gun and, and fight aliens and monsters and all sorts of cause. It was, it was very like Morrisonian in yeah. that regard. Uh, but then that uh, the image of like the long hair and the sword kind of, uh, I gravitated more towards Conan and barbarian fiction. And I was like, wow, you know, there's something, there's something there. And uh, so I just 
wrote the first eight pager, which was uh, this little ash can right here, uh, where he falls from the stars and uh, crash crashes into a world that's I don't know, every barbarian fiction's wet dream, like a bombed out apocalypse. There's there's sci-fi elements, there's fiction elements, there's horror elements. Like Frank doesn't have a whole lot of rules in it, which is what's great about it. Uh, but uh, Frankenstein being like this almost mythic figure was uh, was something else that was fun to, to play with. Uh, I've always loved the universal monsters, uh, specifically Karloff's Frankenstein from 31. Uh, he, he quickly became one of my favorite monsters in fiction. Uh, and he's kind of like the, the Batman of monsters in that regard, where you can kind of do Alvin and the Chipmunks meet Frankenstein and you can do Dark Knight, uh, you know, Frankenstein the Unconquered Frankenstein and it all feels mm. like Frankenstein. It doesn't, like if you did that with Dracula, something would feel a little off, but <laughs> because it's Frankenstein, it, it's, it works somehow. Uh, there's, that, there's a core that's really malleable. And uh, I, I don't know, just the, the, the opportunity to have Frankenstein with a massive sword riding dragons and slaying werewolves and, and vampires and creatures from Black Lagoons. Like, I'm surprised it hadn't been done yet. And <laughs> so we kind of jumped on it. And then, and then of course, when, when I brought the project to Wells, he saw, a lot, you know, because everything starts with a cool aesthetic. And uh, Wells is really great at taking that aesthetic and finding what makes it tick, mm. uh, which a lot of time I like, I, don't, I see the heart in things, but I don't necessarily see the theming of things. And he's like, oh, so this is about like toxic rage and, and, and masculinity and things. And I was like, oh, sure. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. <laughs> and it allowed us to take the ideas and themes from Shelley's original novel, which is a prequel to the series itself and kind of explore a lot of those uh, ideas that m maybe didn't get explored to their fullest uh, outside, you know, because you you've got the, the victimhood and, and the longing to belong in the original novel. Uh, but there's there's a lot of traits about the monster that uh, he he kind of gets from his dad, from Victor, that uh, you can you notice in the book, but don't necessarily get fleshed out in, mm. in uh, I don't, it, it, I, will, I don't want to say meaningful because that book's meaningful, but like it, to take those themes and then kind of spread it out in this, this kind of setting uh, allows us to kind of do that while also being more entertaining than a lot of Gothic fiction of the uh, 17th century, you know, 18th century. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> Lots of opportunities to, to play. Well, I think, I mean, a lot of fans of Frankenstein know the, or understand Frankenstein the movie mm -hmm. version, you know, right. the, the slow moving, kind of dim witted, uh, bolts on the neck, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Monster Squad, you know, Frankenstein, if anyone yeah. ever said almost TV show Monster Squad. Oh, Monster but, Squad's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> and, but Frankenstein of the book, of the actual Shelley book, is so much different. He, he is mm -hmm. almost 180 degrees different than the movie version. Right. So when you were contemplating your story, did you want to, I mean, was there any time when you were thinking of the movie version of him or was it always the Shelley version that grabbed you um, tighter? Uh, <clears throat> I'm always thinking of the Universal monsters. Like each issue, we're trying to bring some bit of Universal in it. Like in issue number two, we're bringing in the Wolfman and the Bride. and you know, The mummy will show up, the creature, that kind of thing. Uh, so Karloff's version of the monster is never too far from my mind. That kind of... Uh, childlike innocence of the creature that mm. uh in Shelley's novel never really gets a chance to even be born like Shelley's monster is eloquent intelligent cold uh a, a real monster right uh not like misunderstood sure but not in the sense of Karloff's Frankenstein where you know he wouldn't hurt anybody if you just leave him alone but you know, right. Shelley's Frankenstein maybe has a bit more of a chip on his shoulder uh, so I, I, I want to bring elements of, you know, all the best of Frankenstein in this version, but it is 100% the monster from the novel. Uh, I, we wanted to kind of show, at, at least at first, uh, you know, give him a chance to actually maybe find peace in the apocalypse. You know, mm. when he first wakes up out of the ice after the end of the novel, he has a chance to actually be a better person and live a life. Mm. Uh, but whether it's his fault or not, we'll, you know, we'll 
explore, but it doesn't work out that way. He can't let things go. He mm. always meets something with violence. And uh, he cuts a crusade across continents and, and is basically the biggest asshole you can imagine <laughs> like we wanted to kind of show this force of nature like he's a force of nature especially in like this first issue like he doesn't talk much uh and when he does talk it's very like poetic we wanted to him to have like this cadence to his voice that was uh still of uh the the 1800s mm. uh so th there's a lot to uh explore in a character like that who is so hardened and uh immovable that uh you don't think there's anything underneath but as the series keeps going we're we're hoping to maybe start chipping away at that that uh that hurricane of, of frank and, and seeing if there's actually anything inside or not i mean there could not be he could just be a shell right, right. Uh, but uh it's going to be fun to find out well um Frankenstein is, as we discussed, is a protagonist, a very fascinating protagonist. But is he the hero? Oh, no. No, Frank's not a good person at all. No, <laughs> uh, not at all. Um, it, this, especially with this first arc, it's very much a revenge quest. Uh, before the events of Frankenstein, the Unconquered, number one, uh, you know, Frank's pretty much seen and done it all. He's conquered multiple continents um and he's pissed off all the wrong people and uh they all get together and shoot him into space They're like all right you can't be they, they pull a planet hulk on him and just shoot him up uh and he he's so pissed that he kills all the stars in the sky to get back and uh so the, these first like five or six issues are him finding the people responsible and making them pay for what they did uh, so it, it's uh, he's a machine of rage and revenge and destruction. Uh, he's not really concerned with the right way to do things, only that they get done as fast as possible mm. uh, at, to his, uh, you know, to the way he wants. Uh, I, in this, in the original Ashcans and the the short story that got published in Descent into Dread, uh, we really wanted to show that he was not a great person, and he he kills like a, a kid in that that first story who uh who shot at him and we we changed that for the for the ongoing but uh he, he he's the kind of guy who wouldn't hesitate to like kill a baby if the baby had a knife to him you know like he's he's not a good person and we get to show as he navigates this land and starts meeting new people like in issue two he meets uh larry who is our, our werewolf who might just be the last good person in this entire world uh and to see them play off each other uh this this like humanistic individual and this monster it's uh yeah you get to see just how vile frank is uh but you still kind of root for him because he's doing such badass things <laughs> like like you can't be mad but you can't root for him you know right 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 like, well, what's interesting about the Frankenstein of of Shelley's book is that he, um, once again, I mean, he realized at some point that he's the only Frankenstein that there is. Mm -hmm. um, he's the only life form that is him. And he's trying to get Victor to create him a female Frankenstein to mm -hmm. find some level of peace. Is that at play at all in the series? Uh, it was. Uh, so we do introduce the bride in issue two through a flashback. Uh, the bride is very much uh, a character in the in our series. Uh, in the original novel, the bride never actually was born. Uh, Victor destroyed her before uh, he had a, before she came to life. He he got he chickened out. He got scared, which uh, I would be too if somebody was breathing down my neck to make a bride. Um, but we we kind of, we we you know we we play fast and loose with science. So uh, the bride is a character. She's so cool. There's that we're actually going to have a whole issue devoted to to her uh, at some point down the line. Uh, so the idea of Frank like finding his people uh, is at at the time of the series starting uh, is long gone. Like mm. he he's given up hope of ever having any sort of connection with anybody 
uh, there, there are no, there's nobody quite like Frank who can actually get him uh, or would even want to. And I don't even know if he would want that at this point. Like he's, he's yeah. over it. Uh, he's seen all of everyone he cared about either uh, got killed or he killed them, you know? Like yeah. he's, uh, it, we do kind of explore a little bit in the, uh, the prose piece in the back of issue one, which we're going to explore in multiple prose pieces going forward. Uh, that there might be more Franks than we're uh, than we think, which uh, your guess is as good as mine because we wrote that as a stretch goal, and I just kind of went -da -da, okay, here we go. This is this is cool. I have no idea where this is going, so uh, I, I don't know the answer to uh, if there are going to be more Franks or or what's in store. But uh, as of right now, Frank is is definitely one of a kind. Well, one. Issue once again in, of Frank in in the Shelley book mm -hmm. is that he realizes on some level he is also immortal. He can be right. like for this in, in this incredible long period of time, and he's unfortunately immortal in a world that he doesn't belong to. Mm -hmm. Now that he's immortal in this apocalyptic future, where does he fit in the world, and does he even want to fit into this world, knowing that I mean, let's face it. I mean, no matter how long this wasteland goes, how long this apocalypse goes, he's going to be the survivor probably mm -hmm. throughout it so does he want to find a spot in the world that he fits in or is it just this one goal that he has uh i don't th at this point i don't think frank has any other goals outside of uh revenge he like i said when he came out of the ice he he had his shot to to really try and find a place in the, you know as a person in a world where everybody accepts you and and you can get along but something about that, that there's something in frank i don't think that uh would even let that happen you know like like of course there's people who uh won't let it happen but i don't know if frank would even let it happen if they weren't there uh he's he's got a bit of a toxic chip on his shoulder uh if he you know at, at some point he found a place in the world at the top of the the food chain like as long as he was you know conquering essentially uh there wasn't anything else to to really do like he's mm -hmm. immortal nothing can stop him so he can just live a life uh pretty much unmolested uh until he gets shot into space uh so after the after the quest for revenge uh ends either you know pleasantly or not uh whatever his goals are are uh kind of beyond him like he doesn't have a plan he, he's very much a one step forward kind of guy mm. he's he's not a, he's not a planner at all he doesn't think about fitting in anymore it's 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 we're, we're long past that it's like this world is not for him to fit in it's for him to conquer mm. so the art is provided by mary landro yes. and the art is absolutely incredible in this oh, series God, so what does mary bring to the table and how does she help bring the story to life oh man do, do, Thought that was obvious she brings she brings frank to the table you know like this this book would not be possible without mary's uh fantastic art like it's so moody and heavy like super dense inks and the cross hatching like we actually worked with mary before on our descent into dread anthology uh she didn't work on frank in it she did like a moody kind of sci-fi piece uh, but we loved her work so much that we were like okay if we're doing Frank, we have to have Mary. We, yeah. we, we gotta. She, she's. If you go to her Instagram, she she has a ton of like Batman, Joker kind of arts, but she's also worked with Todd McFarlane on Spawn. Like she's incredibly talented and, and works well with those moody characters. Uh, she brings a level of craft to this that I. I don't. Frank, I don't think would be near as successful. I mean, Frank wouldn't even exist without her, but hardly, especially not as successful. Uh, on the preview pages, even on the Kickstarter, like uh, there's a there's a 12 panel page that we had written out for her that was supposed to be like a montage of Frank coming out of the ice and then uh, succumbing to uh, his his rage, and that alone could have been an entire issue. And we were like, we may have to like dial this back because it's it's 12 panels, so like, it's going to be a lot. And she just sends it right back to us, like, okay, here you go. <laughs> and like you could tell from the page, it's just effortless storytelling. Like it's not even it's not these static panels. It's super dynamic. And then she follows it up with a double page spread, uh, collage montage. Like 
I I have I have no idea how we got so lucky. Uh, but damn, I I, I kind of really want to do like a big artist edition of Frankenstein, <laughs> like Frankenstein the Uncolored, where where uh, it's just her inks. Oh, would, coffee table version. Yeah, I would love that if we. Maybe that's a stretch goal. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's been announced just now. Stretch yes. goal is now a coffee table edition of Frankenstein art. Well, Gallery. you know, uh, we did ju- we uh, we hit our goal during the conversation. Really? We, uh, we are funded. So now it's all stretch goals, baby. Congrats. <clears throat> thank you. Oh, uh, so excited. Uh, you know, I like to thank Flops as well, our <laughs> uh, our cover artist on our uh, Not Safe for Work cover, which uh, seems to be the big seller. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder why that, that, that does baffle the minds. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> you know, <laughs> <You're> horny. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Apparently, it's, a, it's amazing that sells to... Um, individual to guys apparently who would have thought right who would have thought that uh, <laughs> a series aimed at the masculine image <laughs> right <laughs> so issue one ends in a very interesting way basically frankenstein rips the arm off some guy and then goes mm-hmm. uh, riding into the sunset basically or at least towards the reader mm-hmm. now ending an issue like that where can you go in issue two to top yourself <clears throat> so uh that ending uh, survived all the way from the ash cans to now. Like that, that first issue is like a, a, a decompressed version of the eight pages we orig- originally wrote. Uh, he always ended up riding off into the sunset after uh, a massacre like that. Uh, and it's, it's a, I think it's a good ending for like the first issue because mm. if we don't get any more issues, like that's, that's a good like that's just a cool ending like it's a very it's a western like he just rides yeah. off his it, like that's it um but since it isn't ongoing to to kind of i don't know top might not be the the word because what's cool about frank uh that i'm finding slowly over the series is that it is it does have a kind of western feel to it at times uh, a lot of those early issues a lot of the i think a lot of the first arc ends with him sort of riding off into the sunset after <laughs> his like it's it's kind of like an episode of like gothic gunsmoke where <laughs> it's done and now i'm riding off into the next town uh, so issue two he finds that he finds a new town like he he meets larry our werewolf uh we get a lot of cool flashbacks where we see him and the bride in their heyday back before Frank got shot into space. So we get to kind of see that world that uh, we only hinted at in those, uh, those montages uh, where Frank was king of the world, essentially. Uh, so, you know, we you always got to try and go bigger. Like it, it's not just uh, he falls from the stars and, and kills a bunch of bandits, but uh, now he's he's fighting werewolves and uh, he and the bride are fighting like giant sandworms and there's political intrigue and there's uh, when you see what he does at the end of issue two I've never seen it done I'm kind of proud of it I can't wait to see how Mary does it like <laughs> it's, it's gross it's badass and I'm so excited to show you guys <laughs> So we should all already be following issue three's Kickstarter campaign and get that set up. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, issue three is, uh, you know, we get, we get some Jekyll and Hyde in issue three. It's going to be great. Awesome. Yeah. So um, as people might have guessed, uh, Frankenstein the Unconquered 2 is now a campaign on Kickstarter. So it's it's launched on, was it the 19th? Yes. And that means it's just, just on Monday. Monday. So when does this thing, how long does it run for? It will run until October, oh, geez, about the same time in October. I forget the exact date. Uh, poop. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say mid, mid-October. I just, I'm sorry, I can't remember the final date on that one. No, don't um, worry. But, you, but it's fully funded. You guys have plenty of time to go and contribute and get those stretch goals. Uh, we already met one goal by hitting our funding in 72 hours. So everyone who backs it, in se- everyone who backs it is going to get uh, a free uh, badass bookmark. Uh, I'm getting and- my bookmark. I, I already yes. pledged. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, and we'll probably have some more. 
stretch goals, uh, maybe some more prose pieces. Uh, so there's there's lots to to dig into with this campaign yet, and we still have like 26 more days to go. So very nice. Come on board, guys. <laughs> so, what is the your favorite rewards available on the campaign? My favorite rewards. Uh, I mean that flops cover is pretty great. <laughs> But uh, I also really like, uh, I mean, you can always get a commission from Mary. We have three slots available for, for that. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you like the art in this book, you're gonna want commission. Uh, and then we have uh, the adopt a page I think is the most exciting uh, because in an age of digital art, it's harder than ever to really like own a piece of art from your favorite book. Uh, and since Mary works digitally, we don't really have the, the actual physicals. So uh, for the price of the art on the book, you can uh, adopt a page uh, where you pick whichever page you want from the book. We'll put a little note up front saying that this is your page and then you get a one of a kind 11 by 17 print of that page to call your own. Very uh, cool. It's, uh, I don't see hardly anybody else. I don't know if I've ever seen anybody do the <laughs> adopt a page tier. It, in an age of like, where digital ownership is a big comfort talking point. Like, I think it's important to give fans like a piece of the book. Like you, you, you want a piece of your favorite thing. And uh, if uh, this adopt a page uh, is a way to do that, then I'm all for it. I, I think it's mm. a really cool thing. And I mean, hey, uh, with some of the pages in issue number two, uh, there, there, there's gonna be some good pages to pick, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the stretch goals that, that you have in place? Uh, we have not announced stretch goals since we just got funded, uh, but going off of uh, our last campaign, we did have a stretch goal for the prose piece in the back of the book. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work going forward because we've uh, the prose piece was to be continued, and uh, if we don't meet a stretch goal, then does that mean we don't have the prose piece? I don't think so. So now we're kind of committed to that, that prose piece in the back. Uh, which is called Scrolls of the Vanquished, where we get, uh, it's set back during the Bride and the, the Beast's heyday, where they're kings of the world, essentially. And uh, there's that mystery of, uh, are there other things like them out there? Uh, it's really cool to go back to like uh, the pulpy kind of roots of like barbarian fiction in a sense, uh, and and kind of build Frank up using just words, which, uh, as a guy who's been writing comics nonstop for like 20 years, uh, actually having to stretch my brain and build a scene with nothing but words is hard, but uh, <laughs> it's also a lot of fun. Like you get to really play with language in a way you don't in, in comics. Mm. Uh, so we'll, that will definitely be included. Uh, you know, pay raise for the artists, a great stretch goal. Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll probably be announcing stretch goals here shortly, probably uh, within, I would say within the week, uh, you know, within the seven days. I'm not saying by Friday, <laughs> but uh, and, and, so, and I'm sure we also need more nude covers. Uh, apparently that's the way to go too. I mean, hey, you know, <laughs> we'll just start announcing nudie after nude. We'll, we'll, um, we'll have a whole new trading card set, you know, it'll be great. <laughs> the whole comic book, but in nude form. <laughs> yeah, I... Okay, if you guys want to pay Mary for that, go right ahead. <laughs> I mean, Frank was basically naked the entire first issue. Oh. <laughs> Apparently that did not sell quite as well as the, the other cover that you did, though, surprisingly. Uh, surprisingly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, you're, you're killing it. You already hit your, um, your goal. You're going to at least hit one or two more stretch goals, I would imagine. Maybe three more stretch goals without oh, you know, jinxing yeah. anything. Oh, yeah. Um. So what is in the future of Frankenstein? When are we going to see issue three getting around to it? And what storylines can we look forward to? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, Frank isn't going anywhere. We have, uh, at the moment, uh, first drafts of 13 issues for Frankenstein. Uh, that's about what we planned. Two distinct arcs with a buffer in between. Uh, so Frank isn't leaving Kickstarter. He's, he's going to be coming back nice and strong. Uh, we're launching in January. We're going to be taking a break after this campaign. But in January, we will come back with our other series, Mechaton, uh, doing issue four and five there. 
And then soon after, so I would say probably uh, early spring or so, we will be launching Frankenstein. I don't know if it'll be three or issue three and four. Uh, we, if the doubling up on Mechaton works like we want it to, then we'll probably start doubling up on issues, mm. uh, which is exciting because we get to ha- get these out to you guys faster. Uh, but you know, next year you could probably expect more than just uh, two issues of Frankenstein, which is which is great, and that'll let us get to the end of the the uh, the first arc where. Uh, more action, more monsters, and uh, a, a twist that will set the that'll set the tone for the rest of the series going forward, which uh, is super exciting. That sounds absolutely awesome. <laughs> uh, like I said, I, I got my pledge in there already. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing this oh, completed now, and I want my uh, bookmark. So oh, it's up. coming! It's coming! <laughs> yeah. Hey, dude, we still got 26 days. All right. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it feels good to just kind of sit here and be like, okay, guys, now you be patient. Okay. Now, <laughs> now I don't have to worry. Now you gotta be patient. <laughs> and I'm just gonna sit back and wait for my stretch goal gifts to go in and come in too. Be like, oh, that's another one. Cha-ching! Yep, Cha-ching! There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Big enough stink. We'll get uh, we'll get the uh, the Frankenstein original series on on Hulu. It'll be great. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> if you want to, uh, stre- here's a cool stretch goal. Uh, Frankenstein, the statues. We can send over statues to us too. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> okay. Oh, we could do them like those old like uh, 1960s Universal monster uh, models, where they're like that cheap plastic that you snap oh. together. Oh, like, you have to punch nice. it out, snap it together, and then you have to hand paint it. Like that would. Okay, that's an idea. <laughs> now, now, see, now you got to do this now, right? You got you to call it the, uh, uh, the the Traversing the Stars uh, uh, tier, stretch goal tier, and now yeah. you got to do it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. The Traversing the Stars tier, it'll be an exorbitant amount, and uh, Frankenstein will be nude, so you will have to snap on a penis. <laughs> Well, uh, Mr. Shannon, it was a f- pleasure talking with you, and I Absolutely. wish Kate, uh, Frankenstein um, extreme good luck. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to be on. Uh, talking about. Yes, thank you. Me too.